I wanted to start this session with a poem that I read, which I'll also share on the screen. Which I found awesome. quite beautiful and I wanted to share it with everyone. Oh, she's reading a poem. It's, it's by Rabindranath Tagore. It's called The Flower School. So I'll just read it out. When storm clouds rumble in the sky and June showers come down, the moist east wind comes marching over the heath to blow its bagpipes among the bamboos. Then crowds of flowers come out of a sudden from nobody knows where and dance upon the grass in wild glee. Mother, I really think the flowers go to school underground. They do their lessons with doors shut and if they want to come out to play before it is time, their master makes them stand in a corner. When the rain comes, they have their holidays. Branches clash together in the forest and the leaves rustle in the wild wind. The thunder clouds clap their giant hands and the flower children rush out in dresses of pink and yellow and white. Do you know, mother, their home is in the sky where the stars are? Haven't you seen how eager they are to get there? Don't you know why they are in such a hurry? Of course, I can guess to whom they raise their arms. They have their mother as I have my own. So um, with this, John Anna, it's, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to come and spend a little time and talk about my life and my career in photography. Um, I come from India uh, in Chennai. I grew up and in 1968, when I was uh, 25 years old, after I graduated from my university, I did biology, uh, BSc. Uh, I came to America with the hope that I'll continue my folk singing and be a folk singer in New York City. So when I arrived, I had very little money. I had like a dollar in my pocket. And uh, that's how I arrived in Kennedy Airport. And a friend of mine uh, said that I could spend a few days with him. He will help me stay. So I went every day to the streets. I sang my heart out and people would throw some change. And so this is how I made uh, my early living. And then my visa was about to expire and I was very nervous. And so this lady who heard me sing um, said that she worked for the UN and they have a choir called the UN Singers. And she said, would you like to join us? And I'll try and get you a job so you'll have a visa to stay in this country and uh, you can you can be part of the singers and you can have a job. So I said yes, and that's how I got a job the next week as a messenger to carry the mail from one floor to the other. And uh, then I stayed and uh, I worked as a clerical staff and I started getting interested in photography slowly. I was uh, quitting my musical field because I knew my limitations. I'm uh, not a trained musician. I did go to school. So whatever I played was ear music, whatever I hear, memorized, and I played. So I uh, slowly, I, I started to stop my music and I got interested in photography because my older brother uh, sent me his used camera for me to use because I wrote and told him that I'm very interested in photography. And you know, when I was in Chennai, I went to the Madras School of Arts at night and I studied watercolor painting. So I knew a little bit about composition, uh, a little bit about color. And um, so this sort of helped in my photography. And um, I won a, an award in a major competition. Uh, next slide. Next. Can you change the yes. slide? Yes, yes. One. Uh... Yeah. So I, this picture that you have is the one that won 
uh, the award in in Fodokina, and um, it's a man washing cattle in Chennai Beach, Marina Beach, and um, uh, I uh, by this time I had joined the United Nations uh, photography unit. They asked me to work as a darkroom technician, so that was my first introduction to photography. So I was in the darkroom all day printing other people's negatives. And uh, they also sent me to school to study a little bit about photographic printing. And uh, I actually did a seminar with the famous Ansel Adams, who was the god of black and white photography. So I'm very proud that I had the opportunity to do that. Then um, after this, my uh, director of photography uh, section asked me that she's going to make me a photographer. And my first assignment was in South Lebanon. You can change the slide. Next. Yeah. So my early photographs, as you can see, were mostly black and white, and I honed in my skills. I became a master printer, so I did all the exhibitions. And and um, next, next, next slide. So this is again uh, the Amish farmer. Till today, they live in different parts of the uh, U.S. They originally settlers from uh, Europe, and uh, they don't use any modern equipment. Even today, if you go to uh, Amish farm, they use uh, horse plows and uh, no electricity. Um, so they fascinated me. So I, one of my early essays I did was about the Amish uh, people. Next. This is, again, another award-winning picture for me. It's New York City, and I was passing through in a car when I saw uh, the tombstones and the, the skyline. It's almost in the same level. I used a 35 millimeter lens, and I got off from the car. I told my wife, stop the car, and, and I got out and I photographed this. We almost got a ticket. The policeman stopped, and, and uh, we, we are not supposed to stop uh, on the highway. So uh, anyway. Uh, so this won an award for me. Next. Yeah, this is uh, me in Beirut, um, uh, Lebanon, uh, where, the, where in the middle of the war, uh, all the buildings were shelled. And it was a pretty scary assignment for me because that was my first time I went out and they were fighting machine guns. And I'm not a macho guy. I'm I'm scared like everybody else, but it just sort of felt like um, thrilling to be somewhere in the middle of action and, and photograph. Next. So the next few pictures are uh, in Beirut and around. And I had to commute from uh, Lebanon to Israel um, every day uh, with a peace flag in my Jeep, in front of my Jeep. And uh, for six weeks, I went back and forth and documented from the Israeli side and also from the uh, Lebanese side. One of the things being a photojournalist for the UN, you don't take sides. You, both the sides are part of the United Nations. So I'm supposed to be neutral and document uh, the truth, actually what I saw. So that was a very good training for me. Next. We should, we should never become opinionated about certain things because we are all biased by nature. We, we would always side one particular side, uh, you know, that, that is familiar to us. So uh, this was a very good training to, uh, for a photojournalist, beginning of his career to be neutral. Many of my journalists, photographer friends would always say, how can you do that? I mean, because when we go somewhere, we 
are on you know either the US side or Iraq side or but this was a very good training for me next here you see a uh, family that that uh, the husband and wife Palestinians the next morning after the Israeli air raid was completed they came to their house that was shattered to ground and they're picking up their pieces their favorite chair and and actually this lady insisted that i stayed and had a cup of tea with them because she said you are a visitor and uh, there was no uh, kitchen or anything but she put three stones started a fire and she made tea for me this is in 1978 next here you see chairman arafat um, and the uh, un peacekeeping head general erskin they are discussing and arafat was hiding at that time so i had to go to his quarters they blindfolded me and they took me in two different jeeps and uh, i met him and um, i even spoke to him that day next this is one of my favorite photographs of jericho uh, town in south lebanon and uh, what you see in the back is the old city of jericho still the civilization is continuing and uh, one of the oldest cities in the world just like how we have varanasi in india which is uh, such an old city and um, so i saw the shepherd coming so i uh, took a high vantage point and sat there and waited for him uh, to bring the sheep he was herding them back home to have this view and i took this picture a lot of times when you're photographing don't just go in and shoot and get out try to absorb the situation the surroundings and this way you will make a better picture next this is um one of the rarest photographs because all the reports were only talking about the palestinians uh being a terrorist they are doing this doing that but here the idf israeli soldiers uh, are rounding up uh, school children and they are profiling them and and actually they got very upset that i took the picture and actually um they took my color film that was in the uh, camera and they exposed it uh, but luckily i had two rolls of black and white that i shot and somebody else smuggled this another photographer smuggled this for me and next is also the same yeah here they are profiling them uh, but it was funny like uh, no matter what my bias uh, opinion was but i had to be neutral and document both sides so this was my very first assignment next yeah this is a palestinian camp in uh, beirut and uh, many of them uh, lost their homes and they lived in tents like this next This is one of my uh, favorite pictures of a Swedish peacekeeping soldier who had rescued a little bird that was injured and um um it it shows how gentle he was even though he was a soldier he he liked birds he said he used to bird watch so um it's it's a uh, it's a poignant picture for me next my next assignment in 1979 was uh, the vietnamese boat people uh th these people were fleeing vietnam and uh, because of the oppressive government and um, they were trying to uh, be refugees in different parts of the world this is in malaysia in a place called pulau bedong and i went there and i spent uh, many days there probably 
six or seven weeks uh, all around Southeast Asia documenting the people who are fleeing um, uh, Vietnam and um, uh, countries like America, uh, France, um, and uh, Italy, and also um, Australia took the Vietnamese as refugees and became citizens of that country. So I have to say something very poignant here because a little refugee boy said there are only two happy days uh, in a refugee's life when he flees uh, his country that is so uh, 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 violent to them. And the second happy day is when some country uh, takes us and we go to a new life. Next. Yeah, these are all uh, the refugees and their sufferings. And I photographed this in a, a refugee ship uh, that France had sent. It's a medical ship called Ile de Lumiere. And uh, here's a brother uh, is taking care of his younger brother who was hurt. Next. And here you see uh, in one of the islands in Palau Bedong, there were more than 50,000 refugees who had brought their ship and um, abandoned their ship and they got refuge in the island. Next. And here's a young girl who's sitting and thinking uh, about her future, I guess. And you see the boat in the back and um, um, that's the boat that they came in. And I want to say something at this point, because a lot of times I did not take a picture. I saw another girl, something similar to this, and they came and told me uh, her, her father and mother were killed by the Thai pirates who preyed on their ship, and they took all the jewelry. And this girl, was her life was spared, and she was washed on the shore. And um, um, so I ran to see, and then I, at that point, I decided I won't stick my camera in her face, and I'd rather try to help her. So I had met three Catholic nuns uh, two days before who were rescuing uh, acute cases of children who were suffering. So uh, I brought them uh, to the shore, and they took her. And she lives somewhere in California now. Uh, but I did not take the picture. So when I came back and told my story at a seminar, at a symposium, many of the photographers and photo editors told me, uh, I will never make a good photojournalist because that's not my job. My job is to document, not to uh, be a social worker and help. So. Um, this was a conflict I had throughout my life, but I stayed on course what I believed in, and this is how I was raised by my mother. I lost my father when I was young, so my mother always told me, you know, dignity of people is important, and your role in life, remember, you're not a photographer first, you are a human being, so that's why um, I took a different stance in this, and a lot of times I decided not to take a picture. Next. Here, another uh, sick lady in the medical hospital. Uh, many of them had tuberculosis, TB, and since they were traveling for many days in a small boat in close quarters, they uh, contracted, you know, so. Uh, that was one of the uh, major issues. Next. Here you see the American um, office, um, immigration offices are taking a whole family uh, to USA. Many of them wanted to go to California because a lot of them were Vietnamese fishermen. So they liked the coastal towns and to do fishing. So um, I had the opportunity to witness 
a few of this immigration procedure. Next. So while I was in this in 79, while I was doing the Vietnamese boat people story, I was reading the newspaper and I saw all hell broke loose in Cambodia. They had a dictator, a communist dictator called Pol Pot, and he was killing um, his own citizens. And he uh, proclaimed that nobody should be uh, technical staff, no uh, acting, dancing, no arts, and everybody had to go to the field and uh, uh, plow the field, uh, grow um, uh, food. And so many of them fleed and they were coming into uh, Thailand. Uh, so I went to a place called Aranya Prathet in northernmost Thailand, where thousands and thousands of them coming fleeing from Cambodia. And this was called the killing fields. So I did this on my own. Uh, UN didn't instruct me to do it, but I sent a cable and I said, I've decided to go and uh, document this. A lot of times I didn't have the facilities. Sometimes I took the mass transportation, a bus. Um, sometimes I hired a local youngster to go with me to translate. So I did the Cambodia story like that. Next. The next few pictures are from Cambodia. Here's a refugee child. Next. Yeah, uh, masses of them were in little uh, shacks and um, Cambodia suffered a lot and they are very uh, uh, soft-spoken, gentle people. It always happens uh, when you have a dictator uh, and uh, whose belief is in harsh uh, reality and uh, basically it's misbelief and uh, it never works out and people leave and uh, Cambodia did suffer uh, quite a lot. Next. Yeah, this is uh, a tribe called Mongs and um, uh, also uh, in Cambodia and they are fleeing. And the little girl had a guard like a doll and it made a very nice picture. So when you're a photojournalist, you have to be observing everything that is around you. And sometimes, even though you go for a certain photograph, maybe the actual picture is not that one, it's something else. So that's why I do most of my photography spontaneously. I don't think too much, but just basically I compose and I see that it's okay and I should. So this is something that you have to train. What I do even today, when I'm walking in the street, uh, I don't look at my um, iPhone, but I look at all the scenes and I'll observe how the light is falling, even though uh, I'm not photographing it, but I will make a mental picture of how I would photograph that. So it's a very good training. Somebody told me way back, a uh, photographer said, that's how he does his compositions every day when he's walking, he um, does that. But don't do that when you're driving, you know, then you'll get into an accident. Uh, next. Again, a brother is comforting his little brother. Many of them had no food no shelter. Many of them were separated uh, by Paul Pot. They, he didn't want families to be together. So it was a very sad uh, tragedy. Next. Is it moving? It's, it's stuck. Okay. Uh, this is a little girl. Um, yeah, peeking through. She's playing peekaboo with me. Next. All this is in Cambodia, Cambodia, the border. Yeah, this is the Hmong refugees. Two mothers are saying hello and they're, uh, and they're introducing their babies. Next. This was many years later, I was assigned to go to Cambodia to uh, document 
their first election after Paul Pod was uh, dethroned and they had a uh, formal election and I went there to document. These are the reminders that they have in main streets about all the people who died. Many of them were clubbed by soldiers with a stick and they break their skull. And so it, uh, I saw this boy was shy uh, looking at it, so I took a quick photo of that. This was much later when I went to Cam uh, Cambodia. Phnom Penh. Next. Yeah, this is, um, Cambodians do a very fine dance. Uh, it's almost like our Bharatanatyam that we do in South India. Maybe it went from India because at some point the South Indian rulers had gone to Vietnam and Cambodia. And um, the teacher of the school told me uh, Paul Pot had sent her to prison uh, because she was a dancer and told her that she cannot teach her dancing. So she, while she was uh, uh, in, in a small village with a group of people, every night she will sneak out on especially moonlit night. There was a white wall and she'll go and practice her dance moves as a shadow uh, a dance on the wall. And she said that I was hoping one day my country will be free and I will be free and that I could have a school and teach young girls how to dance. And so here I'm documenting her uh, students in her school. And uh, I felt very happy that I was part of this and I had a chance to document this. And they look like two shadows anyway. Next. Yeah, this is a uh, killing field. The pond had a lot of buried bodies in it, and later it became a lotus pond. So my driver was describing it, and I saw this little girl picking flowers to take it to the market and sell. To me, this is a very symbolic picture of hope. It was a burial ground, and now it's a flower lotus garden and uh, this girl was uh, taking the flowers. So uh, that's this photograph. Next. My next assignment was to go to uh, Iran when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power and uh, the revolution took place and uh, people took to the streets and um, they had held, excuse me, <clears throat> they had held uh, some American hostages. So UN had sent a group of people to go and uh, defuse the situation and to release the hostage, but we couldn't do it. I was sent as a photographer with them, but every day I would go out and document what was happening uh, in the city. Um, this is when, uh, Iran changed uh, well, with the revolution. Next. This is uh, in Tehran University, a Friday's prayer, and uh, they're all praying. And these two kids were holding Khomeini's poster. This picture was uh, shown in many magazines, and um, um, it's also one of my favorite pictures. I had to climb a tree and get this vantage point and shoot. And when I got down, uh, they didn't arrest me. They warned me that um, uh, I should not do pictures like this. And they wanted to know why and all that. So sometimes uh, you have to be very discreet when you're photographing in a troubled situation like this. Next. 1984, uh, Ethiopia had one of the worst famine. People were dying of starvation. I had never seen this in my life with all the travels I had done by then, because uh, uh, we'll see people getting killed uh, in the war, crossfire and all that. But uh, again, Ethiopia had uh, a dictator, a ruler called Mengistu, 
who was a communist leader and uh, he put everybody to work and uh, it was chaotic and many of the people died of starvation. Next. Yeah, again, um, uh, there was shortage of water and here people, children are in the public uh, taps, you know, sucking the last drop of water. It was one of the toughest assignments that I did. Next. Here is a mother with a dying child and uh, many of them walked uh, several kilometers to come to a refugee point where there was UN hospitals and UN High Commissioner for Refugees where they were distributing food. Uh, so people came, many of them carried their children, sometimes brothers carried their younger brothers and uh, they came and they uh, got some refuge and some food. Next. Again, a young girl. Sometimes when you're doing a photo essay, uh, instead of including a lot of stuff, uh, pick one subject and just do a close up. And here, her eyes are so expressive and you can see uh, she's in a lot of trouble. Uh, there's no need to explain the picture. When you see right away, you, you will get uh, the point. And that's what's important. Uh, uh, in, in a photojournalist uh, viewpoint, you should just impact in one image uh, all kinds of emotion. Next. This little child was dying of a liver condition, they told me, and he had his face on his mother's lap, and she had given him a biscuit. Uh, and suddenly he got up and he looked at his mother like with such an adoring uh, smile. And um, so I was on the ground sitting and looking and I quickly took this picture. This was used uh, in, in many articles about hope. Next. Here is a father feeding a 17 year old boy and he was very proud and he also said he was ashamed that he was healthy, but his son didn't get enough food and he was mal malnourished. Um, uh, this won a picture of the year award for me, but uh, the important thing in this photo is that later on I came back after I finished my other assignment during the day and wanted to get where I could send the picture for this father, but uh, in the meantime, the kid had died. Next. Here, uh, a sister brought her brother on her back, and I think she walked several kilometers to get to uh, medical help, but before that, uh, her brother had passed away. Next. Here, the refugees uh, are waiting to get some food. Uh, Ethiopia is sort of split 50% Christians, Coptic Christians, and 50% uh, uh, Muslims. They also have one of the oldest form of uh, Judaism uh, called Palashas. Next. Yeah, these are all refugee camps in different parts of Ethiopia. I traveled all over in a jeep and it was every night I come back and it was hard for me to uh, um, focus on anything because my eyes were filled with tears and um, and what I saw during the day uh, sort of affected me uh, throughout the trip and even later. Next. Here you see a uh, brother carrying his dying son uh, to some medical help. Next. Yeah, every morning in the camps, they brought the dead bodies 
and they washed them and they did mass burial for them somewhere close by. Next. It was probably one of the um, yeah, horrible, uh, tragic um, uh, seeds that I witnessed and documented. It was very difficult to photograph when you see, then you have to compose and you have to think of other things. And then you realize uh, people are dying of starvation. And that's why a lot of times uh, photographers uh, are nicknamed maggots because they just go in, barge, they take the pictures without even any sensitivity. So uh, for me, I was glad I worked at the UN and I have a very understanding, I had a very understanding a photo editor and the chief who always told me, take your time and we are not rushing. And I would also write to them and say, even by mistake, inadvertently, if I had taken a picture that took away somebody's dignity, don't put it on the files. Uh, so I was very glad that I worked in an institution where they respected humanity. Next. Yeah, these are all uh, uh, from Ethiopia. You see that little boys, two of them have a cross on their forehead. They did not have enough uh, medicine to uh, support all the sick children. So when they thought somebody could be uh, could survive, they put a cross on their forehead to mark that, to make sure to give treatment to those children. So it was uh, a very tough um, situation. Can you imagine you come there and then the next morning your child is dead and, and, and the children were taken to the burial ground. So. A mother is mourning for her dead child. Next. Because of water scarcity, uh, they would dig up uh, tunnels and go down in the riverbeds and they'll wait for hours, sometimes 10 hours to get a little uh, flask full of water. And here the children are waiting and this little boy had gone down to get some water. Here, a mother is um, feeding intravenously her dying child. Next. So two years later, UN asked me to go back to Ethiopia in 1986 to document their first harvest because they did not have harvest for many years. This is a grain called teff, uh, something like a wheat uh, grain. So I wanted to make a very dramatic picture. So I used a 17 millimeter fisheye. I was on the ground and this picture uh, for many years was in the UN in the information area where visitors come. So I'm very proud of this photograph that shows their first harvest. Thanks. This is Audrey Hepburn, a famous actress who won the Oscar for Roman Holiday and also My Fair Lady. And she acted in some amazing photographs. So when she was asked to go uh, on her first assignment. Uh, this is actually her second assignment. Sorry, I had uh, put this before. This is in Bangladesh, but she went to Ethiopia first in 1988. And at that time, uh, they told me that I'm going with her uh, to document. Uh, so I stayed with her and uh, we got to know each other. And uh, I, I was a big fan of hers seen her movies in India with my mother. And uh, 
Um, so it was a wonderful experience. And uh, she told UNICEF that whenever she went, if I was free, I should go with her and photograph. Next. Yeah, this is the Bangladeshi children. Here again, I want to tell you an example of uh, a picture that I didn't take. When she spoke to the children, she was telling the kids that during World War II, she grew up uh, being like a refugee uh, because she, her father had left her family and she was with her mother and uh, she was telling about her sufferings when she was a child. So one little girl was very moved by her speech and she ran across from where she was sitting, came to the stage and I was sitting next to Audrey and they both hugged each other and uh, they both cried and they uh, were consoling each other. And I did not take that picture because I wanted to give them the freedom to enjoy their privacy. So later somebody asked me, uh, why didn't you take that picture of Audrey with that little orphan girl? So before I could even speak, Audrey told them, I'm so grateful for John not pushing his camera and taking a picture, but I wanted to enjoy that moment uh, just with her. So uh, these are the things that a lot of times we have to be very sensitive and uh, give enough room just because we have a camera. We don't have to go barge in and uh, uh, shoot hundreds of photographs. We should think about the situation. And uh, here's another example where I didn't take a picture. Next. She loved children. Her last part of her life, she decided to be an ambassador for UNICEF and uh, she traveled to different parts of the world and talked about the children's plight and she would go on TV and raise millions of dollars for their benefit. Next. Here she's sitting with the mothers. Uh, there's a bank called Grameen a Cooperative Bank that was started in Bangladesh. And um, uh, it, this was about the beginnings of it and she sat with women, talked about the problems and the women's issues in, in the developing countries. Um, now the issue is even in the developed countries, even today, um, I feel bad that women are not treated equally like men in most countries, including where I live in America. Next. And that's why I think the girl child problem in India is, is really appalling to think that we are in the 21st century and we abort a girl child and we have to pay dowry uh, to a bride. And uh, uh, in many cases, uh, the brides and the women are not treated equally. And I have seen it myself. And um, uh, I have seen a sad situation in South India where a woman told me that she choked her two girls with her bare hand and rice and killed them as mercy killing instead of them growing up and being tortured in some home. So uh, we, I'm saying this to you all because uh, we have an obligation today to change our society. And I hope uh, you'll all go out and um, be advocates and uh, talk to people and uh, uh, change India. And uh, maybe I'll come and join you all and we can do this together. Next. This she chose as an all time favorite portrait of herself. And she was one of the most beautiful ladies in the world, model, uh, superstar. So when they wanted to run this picture, the editor asked me, will you ask Miss Hepburn whether we can airbrush her wrinkles 
and her popping vein. So when I called and asked her, you know what she told me? She said, Johnny, tell them not to mess with it. With it. I've earned every one of those wrinkles. So that's how humble she was. Next. I also had an opportunity to spend two days with Mother Teresa when she came uh, to the UN to speak at the General Assembly. And I learned a lot from her. Audrey Hepburn, Mother Teresa, and my own mother, they all insisted on human dignity, how we should protect our own dignity, and then we should extend it and protect other people's dignity. So I'm very sensitive about this when I do my photographs. And this is the only way I can show my respect to human dignity. So uh, she was one of the people who told me about this and insisted that. And she was a very humble little lady, funny. She had a sense of humor. And I was so fortunate that I was able to work with her and hold her hand and walk her through the UN uh, to different dignitaries and did her pictures. Next. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I was in Pakistan, even though I was from India, because I worked for the UN. I was in Pakistan twice, and this was in 85. I did stories about working children uh, and children. So um, um, I was about to take my taxi, was waiting outside. I came out, and on the left side corner of my eye, I saw these girls sitting and reading, doing their homework before they go home. And I took two pictures. And this uh, was nominated. It won an award as the best education poster. And it's one of my favorite photographs. Next. I saw a similar scene later in Egypt when I was photographing in Fayoum. And here, all the girls are doing some crochet work. And they all have shoes. The previous one, uh, they were bare for that. So uh, this is, uh, these two go as a pair uh, when I show my work. Next. Uh, this is in Kenya, in Masai Mara, with the tribal community. I'm always very uh, interested uh, in the so-called tribal community because they are not in our mainstream. Uh, they wear different kinds of clothes. So uh, uh, I made a big story way back in 1984 uh, in India on the Banjaras because uh, they were the original gypsies who left India 900 years ago and they became European gypsies as they uh, went by. Uh, and if you um, listen to their language, um, Romani has more than 30% of Sanskrit words. Next. Yeah, this is in Lesotho, uh, where they still perform female circumcision. And uh, they are masked, and they're taken into uh, the forest. And there's a leader, and they perform uh, this. So uh, anyway, I wanted to show this without any gory details about the circumcision, but to show a mass who are different, masks their face, and, and uh, they go in. And they still uh, have this practice in uh, many parts of Africa. Next. This is part of my uh, child labor. I photographed this in Afghanistan, a little boy weaving a carpet. Because little hands, their fingers can make very fine knots. And the carpet is valued according to how many knots per inch. And uh, But it, it's sad that we use children instead of them being in school. So. I did many stories, and eventually UNICEF uh, started to do um, a program where half a day they will do work, and the other half a day 
they go to school in the same place. So uh, many of the Scandinavian countries did not agree. They said children should not work at all. But in certain economic conditions, uh, the children had to work. No matter what we say, uh, the parents would put them to work. So they adapted this, um, this way of helping the children. Next. And here you see uh, little girls weaving carpet. I try to take this through the, the screen, so it, it makes it interesting. Here, again in Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, this is in Pakistan. Afghani refugee children uh, doing some, uh, I think, mechanical work yes. and leather work. They sew leather. Excuse me, into shoes and next. This is a blank uh, slide because, um, oh no, oh yeah, sorry. I had a different uh, picture here in my screen. Okay, This is in uh, Karachi, Pakistan. It's a pavement school and you see um, uh, there's a teacher and uh, these children don't have electricity in their home, so they come to the uh, main road and every evening he teaches for about an hour with the street lamps. And actually, many years ago when I went to up to my high school, I grew up in a small village near Trichy, and uh, the village was called Erangalur. And, uh, we had no electricity at that time. We used kerosene lamp, Petromax, and uh, candle lights. So uh, this reminded me of my childhood. Next. This is in Afghanistan. Uh, again, I'm doing, um, uh, after Russia left uh, Afghanistan, Many of the landmines they planted um, were not taken out. So old people, young children are the victims. And here in this hospital, an old man and a young boy, when they were fitted with a false limb, they both are learning to walk. Next. Here is a father with a child. And the little boy was very happy that I'm taking his picture. He lost his limb to a landmine. But the sadness uh, on the father's face, I still remember how painfully he looked at his son, who innocent boy who lost his leg. Next. I was sent to uh, Kuwait during the first Gulf War, when there were 700 oil wells were burning. And uh, I was to document that and also the plight of the Palestinians who were in uh, Kuwait. And it was a very harsh reality to see um, the flames shooting up like, you know, 40 feet high. And uh, this was midday. Um, uh, the sun was covered with snow, uh, with uh, smoke. And um, I had spent a whole day here because the Allied soldiers who dropped me uh, forgot about me. They went to have a beer and they forgot about the little Indian photographer. <laughs> and for hours I was waiting and I was uh, literally scared because it was riddled with uh, uh, landmines. Next. Yeah, and uh, fire was all around, and I was walking carefully. They told me, be careful, don't step on a landmine, then we won't see you. So I was very cautious, and it was like uh, uh, midnight with everything was covered. Next. Here you see the Allied soldiers checking an Iraqi tank uh, for the soldiers who died. Uh, in it, and uh, the, when I was dropped in a helicopter, when you 
where on the sky you saw 700 oil wells were burning, I mean, in different parts. And uh, it was really spooky. I thought I was in a Steven Spielberg movie or something like that. So these are the soldiers who left me there and forgot about me. But anyway, uh, next. This picture was used many times. Here are the landmines, you know. If you step on one, uh, that's it. That's the end of you. And many of them were not removed. So that was another chore uh, later on. For many years, they were digging out all these landmines. Next. This is Kuwait City. I'm taking this picture from a helicopter. And it looked so spooky, you know. The sky was filled with soot and smoke. And it, uh, uh, it it was pretty scary. Next. Here, uh, the soldiers uh, had uh, settled here in a camp. And now you can see all the oil wells burning in the back. It was really spooky. I mean, it was one of the scariest things that I've been. And then to uh, realize that any moment, uh, you could explode, you know, with a, a landmine. So anyway, I survived all of that. And, and I'm happy I'm here today talking to you all. Next. Here the soldiers are treating uh, some of the sick kids. And I think we should go a little bit faster. I think I've already taken about an hour. Next, yeah. Here are refugees, again, fleeing their country um, from Kuwait. Next. Saddam Hussein did a lot of atrocity. One of the things uh, he did was also planting landmines in um, areas where a uh, lot of Iranian uh, refugees were because they border each other. This boy and his father, uh, he lost everything because of the landmine. Next. Uh, Saddam Hussein also napalm bombed a lot of the people, his own people in the community in villages. Next. This was a risky assignment for me when I went during the war being in the middle of all of this. Uh, this is a, in Islam, they have Shiites and Sunnis, two different sects. This is a Shia mosque uh, that uh, they, the Iraqi soldiers destroyed it. Next. Beautiful inlay work. And uh, if you go to Iran, you'll see uh, their mosaic and their patterns are absolutely brilliant. And we have it too. Um, Kashmir is one of the places uh, where we have in India uh, this kind of uh, architecture and the art. Next. Yeah, this is the ordinance, uh, all the bombs and uh, in, in the Sulubania in a uh, town in Iraq. This is Iran, um, where they had very sophisticated uh, dispersion of oil uh, to the ships. And um, uh, this was all destroyed by when uh, Iran and Iraq had 11 year war, uh, Iraqis bombed all of this. So I was asked to go and photograph this in Iran. I spent a lot of time in Iran documenting this. Next. So all the sad parts, and here's a happy moment. Um, my uh, visit to Namibia, when they got the independence, I was there on the day of independence, and I was uh, documenting the first day, the children proudly showing the new Namibia flag. Next. Probably one of the happiest moments I photographed. These are the Himba tribe, uh, they paint, the mothers and children paint themselves 
with red clay to protect from the mosquitoes. Next. Namibia has beautiful dunes. And uh, I uh, was always interested in uh, doing nature also. So um, later on, you can go to the next one. These are like 300, 400 feet high. Uh, and uh, I did several pictures, even though it was not part of my assignment. But the next year, the UN decided to uh, make six stamps. Go to the next slide, you'll see. I think I have the stamps. Yeah, these are the six stamps. So I'm very proud that I have uh, my photographs in the stamps. Next, 1991. Then I was sent to uh, Bosnia to cover the Bosnian conflict uh, in Yugoslavia when it split. And here's a mother uh, and a wife. Uh, mourning for her husband's death. Uh, Bosnian war was also very graphic. Next. You can go a little faster. Yeah. Here's a mother and child in Kosovo hospital. The only visitor who came every day was her son. And she was hurt by the bomb. And so was this girl in the Bosnia hospital. Uh, next. Yeah. I mean, all the buildings were destroyed. And it was a very cruel war. War is evil. So always remember, there are many other ways of settling a problem, not by force and violence. So we have to figure a different way. That's why Mahatma Gandhi and people like uh, Martin Luther King uh, preached about this. This is, again, the uh, soldiers profiling um, in Sarajevo, which was the hot spot in 92, 93 during the war. Next. Again, in a hospital, the victims. Next. This boy, Alexander, was burnt by a, a Serbian soldier. Uh, with a Molotov cocktail, and and I photographed him. But I'm proud of this picture because because of my story I did for UNICEF. Uh, a year later, uh, the French government uh, brought this boy to Paris and did a full skin graft for him, and he wrote a thank you note to me for taking his picture. Next. This is Rwanda again. Uh, I was there when all hell broke loose. Uh, Goma in Zaire, the neighboring country. Next. These are the refugee camps, uh, borders of uh, Rwanda. Next. These are the unaccompanied children uh, uh, who lost their parents. And they were all uh, together in a camp. And I did a story about these children for UNICEF. Next. Next. Bodies were thrown into trucks. And they were. They did mass burials for them and all over uh, the city. Next. When I finished this assignment and I came back, I had a massive nervous breakdown. And I was uh, uh, not in work. And uh, I, I was given leave. And then I pretty much quit my photography. And um, one day while I was uh, in my home in Queens, uh, I saw this, the next slide, the butterfly and the sunflower. And that prompted me to take my camera and photograph a whole roll. Next. 
Thanks. Yeah, these are, I did five books for children uh, about my experience in all these difficult places. And then they did a book about me uh, as a photojournalist. Next. This is another book I did called Endangered Peoples about uh, uh, ethnic minority people in different parts of the world. Next. Now I'm going to show, you can go fast. These are all pictures from my last book on Kashmir. Uh, so I spent four years going back and forth to Kashmir, uh, Dal Lake. Kashmir, if you haven't been, I insist every one of you go there. This is early morning. They are fixing the price in the floating market, like Wall Street, but they're very honest about it. Next, you can keep going fast because these are just beautiful photographs of Kashmir. And um, so I want to rush it because I want to answer some of the questions you have. And uh, uh, Kashmir is a spectacular place. I walk, uh, walked and took a, um, a horseback a ride through these mountains. And I went up uh, to different parts of uh, Kashmir. Yeah, go ahead. You can go, uh, father and okay. son. And how to use the light. I never used flash uh, because I like a natural light. Sometimes I use a tripod, handhold, practice myself not to shake when I'm uh, taking a picture. Sometimes I can shoot at 15th of a second without any vibration. They take the produce to the market, father and child. Uh, next one is the mother and child. No, oh, this is a father and son heading back in the snow after a day's work. Next. The fishing village, Dal Lake. One day I got a phone call when I was in my house, and the voice said, Hi, is this John? And I said, Yes, who is this? So the voice said, Michael Jackson. So I just freaked out and I hung up the phone because I thought somebody's pulling my leg. But it was him. And later his manager called and he said, Michael wants you to go and photograph him. And uh, uh, so I did. I did his tour, history tour. And Michael said to me, be my eyes and show me what I cannot see. So I said, wow, that is great. So uh, for two years, I was very close. I went to his uh, home. Uh, I used to take his train and go around. And I was like a little kid. You know, he, he was like a little kid because He's very innocent, very, um, and I had a wonderful time working with him. And of course, I lost my hearing because I didn't wear my earplug when I was in 82 concert on stage. And after 20 years, I lost my hearing. But anyway, it's worth it. Next. This is one of my favorite photograph. Uh, it looks like a painting from another time. This is in Morocco. They do a festival called Fantasia. And um, this is, uh, I knew I could do a picture very different. And so uh, I calculated and I photographed. So I'm very proud of this image. Next. You can go now. It's mostly, yeah, this is my favorite photo of Varanasi. Next. Yeah, now I'm going into nature. Uh, this is Antelope Canyon uh, in Arizona. Uh, these are beams coming through. It's a slot canyon. Next. This is Yellowstone, the mountains of Tetons. Again, using a very wide lens. And this is the opposite. A very wide waterfall. I used a 600 millimeter lens and just did a little portrait of this waterfalls. Next. One of my friends who went 
to school with me in Chennai. He's a big shot now. He owns a bank in Singapore. So when he bought his yacht uh, about six years ago, he invited me to go for three months to the North Pole with him in his yacht. So these are some of the pictures from there. Next, glaciers. A happy uh, a dolphin came and just danced for me for a few minutes. This is all in North Pole. Next. Yeah, the scenes are very different. The colors are different, very eerie in some points. Next. Yeah, you can see very different landscape. The sea, the sky. Next. Yeah, this is the um, uh, polar kiss, the two siblings and the mother, polar bears. They are spectacular animals. Yeah, he's, uh, he's playing peek-a-boo peek with me. Next. Yeah, polar sunset was spectacular. You're much closer, you see. Next. Next. Yeah. Now I want to show you my latest involvement with Save the Tigers. I come to India uh, twice uh, a year uh, because I want to be part of this and I don't want this to be vanished. But the good news, they're saying they're already off the endangered list. You can go fast. It's all tigers here now. Yeah. Next, yeah. They are spectacular animals. Every time I see one, my heart will stop for, for a second. He is very happy rubbing his back on the grass. They are 500 pounds. This is a langur monkey, a micromanager. Uh, I used to have a boss like this, wanted to know everything. Next. This is a uh, Masai Mara. No, sorry, Namibia. Uh, yeah, the zebras. Sometimes you have to wait for the four zebra to come. Don't get away after you see one or two. So that's where the patience, uh, you develop a kind of patience. I meditate when I'm doing wildlife. Next, this is cheetah in uh, Masai Mara. I think I must have had my lens cap on. He was laughing. Now that's the way they yawn. This is a cheetah mother. Last year I was in Masai Mara. Uh, this is a few weeks old baby. She's teaching how to hunt next. Sometimes you vary your pictures. See different angles. Uh, I, I like this photograph even without showing the mother. So that's uh, your secret. You have to figure ways of showing something that is different from what everybody's shooting. Next. And make it interesting. This is a puffin. You know puffins? Uh, uh, this is in uh, near Alaska. Uh, they come from the north, lay their eggs, and then uh, feed their chicks for several weeks. And a few weeks before they're fully developed to fly, the parents will move. The chicks will follow after 10 days and joined their parents. How uh, wonderful is that? I mean, that's why I'm always intrigued by birds. Next. This is a uh, uh, fisherman in uh, Alaska, cut line. Uh, these are the grizzlies, very dangerous uh, animals. They can rip you apart and they're very good uh, fishermen. This monkey is in Japan in Nagano, they come and take the spa, uh, which is uh, sulfuric water, good for your skin and all that. And he's like the Rodan thinker, and he's meditating. Next. Yeah, this is in Yellowstone. Uh, he's looking at me. Always the animals. They know who's there, an intruder, photographer. Next. Yeah, it's about the angle you shoot here. I'm shooting from the top. So when 
the bird fluttered, all the droplets made the rings. So I saw this before and I photographed. Next. It's a little hummingbird. It's only about your size of your thumb and they flap their wings 55 times in one second. Next. Yeah, a bad hair day. This is in Alaska. Uh, I've been doing some pictures of the eagles. Next. Yeah, he's flying right at me. I was on a tree, climbed the tree to get to that vantage point and shooting straight on. Their wingspan is eight feet long. Uh, and uh, these are the cranes in Japan. Uh, they're called red crested cranes. Beautiful. A family dancing. Mother, father, and the baby is in the back. Next. These are cranes in the US. They're called uh, sand hill cranes. The, the beauty of the cranes, they dance. When they see, they show the emotion by dancing. And the babies learn from the parents. And when they are about to mate, when they are pursuing um, a mate, they both dance and it's, it's spectacular. But you have to wait and catch them when they do that. Next. So everybody went on the moon rise and photographed. I went too, and it was all dark, uh, just silhouettes. So I put a search to see when the moon was setting. And it was in the morning. At the same time, sun was raising. So I was lucky. I went the next morning, and I photographed. The birds were lit, and the moon so. That's a little secret from me. My new work is finding beauty in abandoned places. This is in a slate mine. Slate has iron ores, so they have rust after rain. So I see forms and figures, and I'm photographing. These are make very big prints, and people uh, like to hang them because um, they don't have a particular motive. It can fit in anywhere and colors. Next. I call this moon rice. It's again uh, slate, a rock. Next. This is a, a, a tree. There are three trees here. I compressed it with a long 600 millimeter lens. So, so it looks very abstract. Next. These are prayer flags in Bhutan. Again, a very close-up of it makes it abstract. Next. I, I want to share a proverb that, that my mother taught me when I was a young man. It's a Sanskrit proverb, anonymous, uh, written 3,000 years ago. Till today, it's so good whenever I question myself, I say this prayer, look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the realities and principles of existence, the bliss of growth, the splendor of action, the power of glory. Yesterday was just a dream. Tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. So we have to live in the present. And thank you very much for your patience and listening to me for more than an hour. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I would finish this in half an hour, but I, I got carried away. Oh, no, I think uh, personally, I'm quite speechless after listening to you and seeing those photographs. Um, can can we take some questions? Can we take some questions? Yeah, please go ahead and ask me the questions. I'll do my best. Sure. 
sorry I, i'm just going to have to go through them give me a give me a second yeah just a second she's just going to yeah yeah take your time yeah we have 15 minutes i think so um can you tell us a little bit about a little more about uh, your childhood and um, your time growing up uh, as a child and as a college student in tamil nadu can you tell a little more about your childhood growing up and in, in tamil nadu in chennai yeah i have very fond memories my older brother passed away a few years ago so uh, my mother passed away 20 years ago uh, my sister who lives uh, in bangalore uh, sometimes we write to each other and most of our conversation or chat would be about our childhood because we really had a wonderful childhood my father was the principal of the school i went to my mother was a teacher in my in the same school and they both were a loving couple and uh, they were good parents and they always taught us good things to do even though we had very minimal no electricity no cars and uh, we only had like uh, bullock carts and uh, we walked and um, water came from a well and so um in a village but still it was a very uh, a happy life and uh yeah the the village i grew up is called irindalur uh, it's very near samayapuram uh, which is a very uh, uh famous temple there uh, sri rangam and all that so uh until my high school i studied with the kerosene lamp and uh, one hour at night we do our homework and then it's dark we go to bed and get up in the morning and so uh, i was very interested in uh, uh, athletics so i did high jump pole vault and i was really into uh, track and field and i played soccer um, later when we came to chennai i got interested in cricket so these are my uh yeah we moved to chennai um i'm trying to think what year 19 uh 59 i think yeah uh so i went to madras christian college for my pre university and i studied in chennai my biology degree uh in uh, new college can you tell us a little bit about uh, your calling for america uh, you know guitar in hand because that must oh. have been a really big step um for you yeah. you just 20 years of age and you took such a big decision and what was it like after you moved and how did you really create a space for yourself there she wants to know you know how what was your calling to come to the united states and then um how you landed and how you 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 should tell them the air india story and i when when i finished my college um for a short time i worked for bidwi bidwi mills uh where i was a supervisor and then later i took a job with air india uh because after one year air india gave a free ticket to go up to us uh for the employees after one year you worked so i worked for one year 67 to 68 and during that time um i had a rock and roll band in uh, chennai we played music on weekends in jimkana club and uh, various colleges and uh, i also sang uh, as a soloist uh, picked my guitar and uh, sang folk songs so my dream was to come to new york and become a folk singer and uh, that's why i uh, joined the un and after one year they gave me a trip i came on the trip and they let me take 7 dollars for one month leave but uh, uh, i spent 
most of the money in the plane and my whiskey and cigarettes. But anyway, don't smoke cigarettes. I had this bad habit and I quit. I want to advise you, uh, don't do that. That's bad. Uh, but uh, that's the reason I came. And photography was just an accident. Uh, I uh, Then I realized that my scope in music was very limited because I didn't know how to read or write music. I just played by ear. So uh, photography, I was learning from the basics and I studied with people like Ansel Adams. So I knew that I had um, a better scope. And even in my early years, I realized that. And that's what I want all of you to do. Uh, sometimes go meditate, stay for a few days by yourself and try to figure who you are. I mean, I still haven't figured out who uh, I am or what I'm made of. And this is the struggle we have to go through all our life and make ourselves better and better and better. And today, after 50 years, every day I'm learning something new in Photoshop. And I get so excited. I tell my wife, oh my God, I just found out this little thing that I do. So um, that you have to have something that motivates you to keep improving. Many people say, I've been there, I've done that. That's not true. We have not been anywhere and we have not done anything. And that's the way I feel. And I hope I'll feel that way until I die. Considering uh, your shift to photography, has your love for music still continued? And how do you keep that with you even today? Uh, since you shifted to photography, uh, how do you mean, are you still interested in music and? Oh yeah, I'm still interested in music, but uh, my, for a long time, uh, for almost 40 years, I didn't touch my guitar. I was only into my photography. I spent like, I eat, think, sleep, walk, photography, because it was part of me uh, all through. And so I completely neglected. But now my wife got me a super duper guitar, which I don't deserve. But every day I try to practice. But my timing is a little off. But uh, maybe when I come to Chennai next time or to South India, I'll, I'll sing for you all, maybe a song. <laughs> the next question, um, how much of your photography is related to what you read, see, smell, and feel? Can you explain one photograph which relates to something you read or you heard or you saw? Um, did you hear that? No. No. She wants you to take think of one photograph that is a result of something you read, you heard, or you you saw that inspired you to take that photograph. I guess. Yeah, I. To be honest with you, I would like to say that I haven't found that photo yet, and that's why I'm searching every day. But there are a few photographs I'm proud of like the picture of the bird puffin. Uh, I wanted a picture that was dramatic. Puffins look beautiful only with their profile. If you look at them straight, their beak is so flat, uh, they don't look pretty. So that, I waited for three hours uh, on my knees inside a hide with my long lens uh, for that one photo. So then I have a picture that I did in Morocco uh, of the horseman, which looks, everybody says it looks like an old painting. And I like the Pakistani girls in a bench because it was spontaneous and I captured the moment. If you look closely, uh, one of the girls saw me. So she was sort of giggling, but all the others were constant 
training and their study. So there are just a few like this, and uh, these were all, some are meditated. Uh, I look for the image, some were just spontaneous. So uh, I like to be more spontaneous than pre-planned uh, uh, photograph, because I know many of my friends plan, and I've seen them setting up a scene exactly where they want the light. And so this is not my cup of tea. I like to capture what I see. So that's why a lot of times I, when people ask me, what kind of photographer are you? I tell them I'm a street photographer because I was influenced by uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was uh, a French photographer. And he was spontaneous and he took so, um, I like that kind of photography more than a pre-planned photograph. How do we find the capacity for happiness or staying joyful and full of hope and empathy when nothing is really going our way or we're in the midst of a lot of suffering? How do you keep... Um a positive attitude in the midst of all this kind of mess we're in in the whole world right now. You know, um, that's why I was telling uh, you that my mother always told me to have my feet planted on the ground and remember where you come from, remember who you are. I'm proud of my uh, uh, growing up in in a small village in South India. I'm proud of my Indian, uh, South Indian heritage. So uh, all of this makes you uh, in some ways be leveled on the ground, not go with what you, you are doing and uh, who you are with. And this is what happens to a lot of people when they become um, somebody in their field or whatever, or when they have a lot of money, uh, uh, become rich, or uh, you're a genius, you, you're a smart person. Uh, all that means nothing. It, what really is important is who you are. So that keeps me, there's always a check. And I also like to live uh, today. That's why the proverb I recited was about looking to this day, because every day is important. Today is going to be yesterday, tomorrow. So we should try to live in the present. And that's why it's called present. It's a gift. And I try to live uh, what I'm doing today. And that's why every day I'm learning. Many of my friends say that they've learned everything. They've seen everything. I've been to more than 100 and 40 countries or so, but I still feel like I've never been anywhere because there are so many countries I haven't been to and the culture. So that's what keeps me going. I'm uh, one of the advice my mother told me, John, don't ever lose that little boy who's inside of you. And that little boy is always there. And, uh, that's how I keep my sanity, and I always feel uh, tomorrow's going to be different. It's going to be better, and uh, we have to have that attitude. Right? <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you embraced change? Um, especially you know, during your move or from your move from a particular type of photography to another? How did you, how do you embrace change in particular moving from you know, your photojournalism photography to your wildlife photography or moving from different phases? Yeah, I, it's a very good question because it's, it's a challenge. Uh, because one time I went with a friend of mine who's a sports photographer. And I said, I want to do some uh, photographs of tennis. And I went and I started photographing. And I thought I did a great job. When I came back, I compared my pictures with him. He had 
in one frame the racket, the ball, and the tennis player's face. All of this in one frame. And that's when I learned. I, I know very little about sports photography. So it's the same thing with uh, nature and animals. It's very different from humanity. Uh, you have to observe the beauty, whether it's an ugly scene, you want to present it in a presentable way. So it, it's a challenge. So I like the challenge. I don't want to be um, happy with what I know and what I do. I want to be challenged every day. That's why when I go to the wildlife, when I chase the tigers, or when I photograph uh, wild horses or uh, birds particularly, you got to be, it's a split second, you have to make the decision and nail the picture because uh, that's a challenge. And plus, it has to be technically good. Uh, people should like it. You should. Uh, many people say, I photograph just for myself. I don't. I photograph not only for me, I photograph for my audience. I uh, want the people who look at my pictures uh, to feel happy. And here I want to share something with all of you. Uh, one of the things I learned from my mother again, she told me, learn to acknowledge and realize what true happiness is. When you understand that, it's amazing because happiness is there every moment. Happiness for me is sitting in front of my computer and talking to all of you. Uh, happiness is the food I eat, the people I meet, and the new things I see. So that's what we have to realize and to understand. Happiness is not a, a lot of money, uh, a big house, uh, comfort. It's an everyday life. It will come and it will spark and learn to recognize and hold it. But you cannot hold it. It will slip away. And you have to wait for the next moment when you will see happiness in a different form. So uh, these are the challenges I like to do even in my photography every day, learning something new. So um, you visited a lot of different places and you had to interact closely with people going through various experiences. Was there ever a time that you felt like you were not supposed to be there and that you didn't belong at that moment? And how did that make you feel? And what did you do about it? Um, so was there ever, explain a time when you were somewhere, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, where I shouldn't have been. Yeah, where you felt yeah. you shouldn't have been. Yeah. Many times, especially when I was assigned to do the war areas uh, where there were gunfires all around. Sometimes I had witnessed, they start my car, my Jeep, and uh, they shot the other uh, passengers who were going because they were in conflict in a checkpoint. I, I immediately think, why did I take this assignment? I could have refused. Uh, but also when that adrenaline pumps in when you have a certain kind of uh, uh, a spark uh, uh, or a shock. Uh, it sort of uh, revives you. And, uh, and, and that's what keeps me going. And maybe uh, that's why I continue to do. And uh, now when I uh, do nature and wildlife, I never have that feeling at all because I can sit I can meditate. A lot of my friends get bored sitting there waiting for a bird to come and they leave. But I sit there because I can use the time to think about my past and uh, where I am and uh, what I might see. Sometimes I imagine things. Uh, sometimes my imagination uh, uh, comes true. So that's why uh, I want you all to uh, take your time and don't rush 
into doing things. I mean, if you're a photojournalist, you have to escape bullets and fighting. It's a different thing. But and also um, uh, very important that we all do our best. Always do your best. And also, when you go to a new place or when you go to a place when you see a certain thing, whatever it is, pretend like you'll never see this again. This is the last time you're going to see it. So then your photography becomes a little bit different. You are figuring out what angle, where I photograph, which way, uh, colors, uh, whether something is uh, distracting. So think of all this and, and train yourself to be quick and fast. And at the same time, train yourself to be quiet, peaceful, and uh, reflecting on your own past and sit and meditate and do your photography. So we have Jay Singh Anna who has joined us um, in the session. Jay so um, I thought I could ask him to say a few words. Oh, Jay Singh is going to speak now. Hi, Jay Singh. Okay. Um, wait, wait. He's just connecting us. He's just connected. They're just connecting. Uh, hi, Anna. Hi, hi, hi. Anna, welcome now. Hi, hi, Jay Singh. How are you? I'm good. Now. How are you? Happy to see you now. Yeah. My my thumbie I never had. <laughs> You're my real thumbie. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to talk. But very happy to see you. You can carry on now. Carry on, please. Happy to see you, and you can carry on. To her. I guess more questions. Okay. And then walk an animal. Is there? Is it boys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear a lot of birds. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. evening. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, th there's a lot of birds near my house. So uh, now the lockdown days, I can hear a lot of bird sounds. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, there's a question about the biggest lesson you learned from Ansel Adams. The biggest. What's the biggest lesson you learned from Ansel Adams? Uh, technical perfection. I learned that from Michael Jackson also. Michael Jackson was a perfectionist in his dance moves, his shuffle. Ansel Adams was the same. Uh, when he devised the zone system, it took me quite a bit of time to understand how he split uh, white to black in seven zones and how he would place the value on which zone and do the photography according to that. And when you do something like that, you make almost a perfect photograph. I don't think anybody can make a perfect photograph, uh, but we all try to, and that's what he taught me how to struggle and to get and to uh, learn from new things. Learn if if Ansel Adams would have been alive today, he would have been the first one to adapt digital photography and do it uh, differently. Because I think it's. Um, uh, and also, I was in awe of him, and I was also studied under another great technical uh, photographer uh, called George Tice. He was a printer who did mostly platinum prints. And um, so these are all masters who struggled through their lives and figured out ways, and then they teach us how to do it. So whenever I see people like that, and not only Ansel Adams, even when I see an amateur photographer, when I go for a photo contest to be a judge or something, I learn from every photograph I see because we all have different minds and different ways of seeing things. And that's what's the greatness 
is about an artist, uh, whether you're a painter, musician, or a photographer. And uh, that's what I try to learn. We all learn from each other, and that's what I'm trying to say. Can you talk about the process of unlearning and how important is that? And what have you had to unlearn during the process in your journey? Can you talk about the process of unlearning? Unlearn? Yeah. I, I don't understand your question. Say it again, please. Um, so they've asked, can you talk about the process of unlearning? The process, can you talk about the process of unlearning? Somebody has asked. I, and what was that you said afterwards? And um, how have you, what have you had to unlearn in your journey? Have you, what have you had to unlearn? You mean, uh, in your journey? I still don't understand. You mean, uh, not learn from somebody? Is that what you mean? Or what have you, you know, what you've already learned and maybe have to learn afresh? What have you or already to look at it from a completely different perspective? Something you and break away from, uh, I think in relation to photography, what have you thought you you knew and then you had to realize it was wrong and you had to unlearn it? Oh, I, I get your point. Yes. Um, I, I, I say uh, I learned from my mistakes, you know. And so this is uh, something when I did a book recently on Kashmir. So I had notes of the mistakes I made uh, in my previous photography. Uh, this was wrong, this is wrong, like that. And when I went to do the Kashmir book, I try to avoid the practice that I did, which was a failure, and that amounted to some degree of success because we learn from our mistakes. And uh, I hope you're asking uh, something like that because unlearning, when you learn something, uh, uh, it's where well, you've learned something uh, that's not uh, the right thing, uh, then I call that a mistake, and uh, you don't follow that pattern. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, she's reading questions that people have asked. Um. So what brings you to India every year in the same way that you found a calling to go to America? Why do you, why do you keep coming back? What is um, the reason? Uh, what, what, uh, why do you keep going back to India the same oh, way? Uh, because I, I, uh, I missed uh, like almost 50 years of my life. Uh, I lived in America. And um, and as I said before, I'm proud of my heritage, where I come from, and I'm proud of all the uh, festivals we celebrate, the good and the bad. And uh, so I keep coming back. But lately, uh, because of uh, nature and tiger, and for my own pleasure to photograph, and also I want to come uh, back and uh, make in a small way a difference, especially on the issues of women. So this is something that bothers me. And also we have extreme poverty, uh, extreme wealth. Uh, so um, I know it's not easy to bridge this gap, but at least educating people uh, to respect each other uh, and also uh, respect women, because I think this is our major problem with all the development, scientific development uh, that we have done 
we are still primitive when it comes to what we do to um, our women. And, uh, and I also have a lot of close ties with my friends. My, I still have friends that I've known from high school and college days. I'm talking 65, 60 years ago. And uh, so um, it's important for me to come and be with them uh, and share uh, what I've seen and uh, learn from them what I've missed in 50 years. So I'm basically a very sentimental uh, human being who, who likes to uh, be close to the people that I know. And now you were going to make a big trip in November. Yeah, yeah. We were going to go and, but yeah, it's all my canceled. wife uh, is telling me to uh, say that uh, we are planning. We we plan to be there now uh, because I wanted to November. go one uh, one time again to the jungle and photograph the tigers because they say that now they're increasing uh, in numbers. And there are many mothers with cubs and all that. And uh, so we couldn't go because of this coronavirus. Uh, so maybe in November, we plan to come. And I, I would probably like to come one more time after and do a joint venture with maybe people like you, whoever wants to join me and to do something with the women's issue. Because in one area, where we can go and document this uh, visually is in Varanasi because the widows come there and wait to die. And uh, we could uh, do that. And even if I don't come, I want all of you to think about this issue uh, because you're all living in India and, uh, and uh, try to make a difference, try to make people in the villages uh, with the, uh, uh, less education to understand the importance of uh, uh, the equality between men and women. We are the same, just that gender separates us into a different category, but our thinking, thoughts, intelligence, everything, we are the same. And, uh, and this is what I want every one of you when you go. Uh, uh, focus on this and always be proud of who, are, who you are. There's nobody else like you. Uh, and and uh, that's my humble request to all of you who are listening to me. Can you recommend um, five books or five documentaries or even five photographers uh, whose work you think we definitely need to um, study or look at? Can you recommend uh, five or so photographers or books or documentaries that you would um, recommend they see for inspiration, for learning? I, I could think of uh, uh, people uh, that influenced me, I can say, like Ansel Adams, Katia Brasson, uh, Eugene Smith. And there are lots of Indian photographers today. And every time I come, I see young people who are... So uh, a lot of times, don't hesitate to learn from your own friends, you know, that you go with, because uh, he's not you. That's the way I look at it. When I come with and teach photography, when I'm with my students, I look at everybody's work because I have a selfish reason to understand how his way of interpreting the same scene that I saw. So this is an important thing. And also go to the libraries and uh, uh, even if you don't have to buy, uh, go to the galleries go to different art shows. I learned a lot from uh, the Dutch painters because uh, they uh, were very tied up with the light. Light was 
light is the most important thing in all of what we do, especially uh, art, uh, sculpture, photography. It's it's the way we see the subject in light. So uh, the Dutch photographers, all of them, go buy some wonderful books on paintings or take a book out and look at how the Dutch masters interpreted portraits or a scene or light. And I think we, personally for me, I learn a lot from artists or painters uh, uh, more than what I learned from photographers because uh, they interpret and they actually draw and paint. We use an instrument to capture that. So there's a big difference. And I think when you see how an artist struggles to make a painting look in a certain way, and if you can replicate in your photograph, uh, uh, it's great. So a lot of times when people come and say, oh, some of your pictures look like a painting, I take that as a great honor because that's what I struggle to do. Does that make sense? Any any other books that uh, you've read which um, you really liked and you would recommend to all of us here? She's still asking about books that you would recommend to all of them here. The Art of Seeing is one. Remember The Art of Seeing? Yeah, there, there's a book called The Art of Seeing by a Canadian photographer. I forget his name. I'm not. I'm 77 now, so slowly my memory is fading. Uh, that's a good book. And uh, look at Cartier-Bresson's work, his life work. He spent time in India. He spent time in different parts of the world. And if you ever talk about a photographer who was spontaneous, that's him. And Eugene Smith uh, was another documentary photographer who did many, many stories in the US about um, so many different things, subjects. And so, um, and there are Indian photographers. You you can, uh, Raghu, Raghubir Singh, uh, I think he passed away a few years ago, is a, one artist. of the wonderful photographers. It's available photographers. on yeah. Amazon, The Art of Seeing. Yeah, The Art of Seeing. It's available uh, on Amazon. Is, is on its eighth edition. I, Probably it'll send you. Uh, no, it's on Amazon. Huh? It's on Amazon. Oh, it's on Amazon. You can you can get it. It's not an expensive book because that trains you. Even my recent work, I call it the art of seeing. It's the way you interpret uh, uh, into a photograph. So that's exactly what I said earlier when we talked about when I'm walking. I look at the scene and I see how the light is falling and which angle will be better to even, I'm seeing walls here in my apartment and I, I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, if I go to the other side, uh, it'll be a little bit different. So here I want to share something very interesting. I was with a little boy, 10 year old boy, uh, African American, my friend's son, He's a very smart kid, and he told me, how do you uh, compose a picture? So I, I told him, when I see something, it registers in my brain, and I go and I photograph. He, his name is Joey. So Joey asked me, but John, I bet you don't go to the other side and see the same subject you want to photograph. And I said, why? Try it next time, it's so different. And do you know something? He taught me something I'll never forget because now when I see something and I try to photograph, I look at it from all angles, possible angles, and I try to do the picture. And if I have the time, and if I could go around and take, I I do that. And that, that's a, excuse me, that's a, Wonderful lesson he taught me. 
So I think we've come uh, to the end of the session. Um, I we want to dedicate this session to um, to to the kids who are affected by war and to their plants and their dogs. They want um, to dedicate this session to the kids who are affected by war. Oh, say it again. They want to dedicate this session oh, to, to the kids who are affected by war. Yeah, and, and also I want to share something which I learned when I was very young. Uh, you started with Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore's poem. My father studied under him uh, in 1932 uh, in Shantini Ketan. So when I was growing up, I was always reminded of the greatness of Tagore. So one of the things I always remember, because love, love is what makes us all go around. And Tagore said something about love in a very profound way in two sentences. He said, may my loving you not be a burden on you, for I freely chose to love you. Think about that love, a love that has no conditions. You just want to love somebody because you want to love them. Thank you so much, Jonana. And uh, we'd also really like to thank uh, Janet for, for being with us today. Janet, if you could come and say so we could see you. And thank you personally for helping us. Thank you all. Thank no, you. no, she, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I cannot come on, on the screen because I'm not dressed. It's early. It was early morning for us. So, uh, but I listened to the whole session and, uh, you know, look forward to hopefully meeting you all one yeah. day. I'd like to meet many of you when I come next time to India. We both are coming hopefully in uh, November and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll all meet again. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh to be with you. Please do come and visit uh, Cuckoo Forest School when you do uh, come and conduct a workshop. It would be really lovely to have you. So thank you so much. I think it's been a really enlightening and a very humbling experience personally. And I think I can speak for the rest when I say this. Um, thank you. It's one thing that uh, we tell everybody at the end of the session, which is to please write about uh, the session today, um, preferably as soon as it gets done. Uh, this is for your own personal record. You can share it with your friends, share it with your family, put it up on social media. But these are rare chances that we get, and, um, and it's really important to document them, document what you're feeling, what you've learned through these. So please do write after this session. Thank you once again, John and I. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. And Thank have, you. have a good Have evening. a wonderful day.